All right, well, it's uh, good to be with you this morning, to be back with you. And I get to talk about dinosaurs and the Bible. And if you're wondering what dinosaurs have to do with the Bible, boy, are you in the right place this morning. You see, secularists like to use dinosaurs almost as a substitute for an actual argument for evolution. They'll just say dinosaurs, and that proves evolution, apparently. Uh, they're not actually presenting any evidence. They're just telling a story that uh, involves evolution and involves dinosaurs and hoping that you'll believe the story because it looks so compelling and because, it, because it's interesting. So, but the Bible actually has something to say about this topic, and we can use the truth about dinosaurs to expose people to the gospel. I can't think of a better use for dinosaurs than showing people the gospel. So what are dinosaurs? We should start with that. You probably know they're reptiles. They are reptiles, so they're scaly creatures, but they are, and they're land reptiles. Uh, now we'll talk about other things like plesiosaurs and, and pterodactyls, which are flying reptiles, uh, but technically they, those are not dinosaurs. Dinosaurs by definition are land reptiles, but they are different from modern land reptiles in two ways. First of all, they had large uh, skull holes. So in, in their skull, they had these large holes besides just the eye sockets and things like that. And that was perhaps to reduce weight. The, the main characteristic that makes them different from any modern reptile is they had their back legs underneath their body like, like we do, kind of. Uh, whereas modern reptiles have their legs out to the side in a sprawling position, like an alligator. Think about that. And so, because uh, so, some people ask, you know, is a dinosaur just like an alligator that got big, you know, because he lived a long time? No, their structure's different. They have a different type of anatomy because of their hip structure. And so they are a unique... Um, creatures in God's creation, several different varieties of them. We'll talk about that. When we look at dinosaurs, as when we look at any topic, we can look at it from the perspective that God's word is true, or we can look at it from the perspective of uh, human beings independent from God get to determine truth, secular view. My secular colleagues, when they, when they look at dinosaurs, they already have some beliefs in their mind. Uh, people like to think that, you know, we're all very neutral and objective, but we all have beliefs that affect the, the conclusions that we draw from the data. And so um, my secular colleagues are looking at dinosaurs and they're thinking in terms of evolution, millions of years of death, suffering, disease, and bloodshed, turning one kind of organism into another as they, as they reproduce over the generations. And so they, when they look at dinosaur fossils, they already have some of those thoughts in their mind. When I look at dinosaurs, I'm thinking in terms of biblical history, where God created a perfect world originally, and then that world was ruined when Adam sinned and rebelled against God. That brought death and suffering into the world. God cursed the earth because Adam was given dominion over the earth. And then there was, of course, the flood. There was a catastrophe of waters, the confusion of Babel. Uh, God himself steps into history to take our place on the, on, the, on the cross. And then in the future, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And in a sense, that's already started, because if you're in Christ, you're a new, you're a new creature, you're a new creation. But uh, we, that hasn't been completed yet. There will be a time when there will be no more curse, no more death, and we all look forward to that. When I look at dinosaur fossils, I'm thinking in terms of the true history of the universe as recorded in the Bible. So you've heard of virtual reality glasses that you put on and let you see what's not there. Uh, I like to think of the Bible as biblical reality glasses that let you see what is there. It kind of filters out all the false, all the false uh, claims and lets you see the truth. We're supposed to reason, and we're supposed to reason from the scriptures. And so let's put on those biblical reality glasses and see what we can conclude about dinosaurs. We can conclude, for example, that they were made on day six. Why is that? Because according to scripture, all land animals, everything that creeps on the earth was made on day six of the creation week. So dinosaurs are land animals by definition. Land animals and human beings for that matter were made on day six, therefore dinosaurs were made on day six. And again, that's not what we're taught in the schools. It's certainly not what we see at the movies, but it is what the Bible teaches and it's therefore true. Dinosaurs are land animals and therefore made on day six. They're not millions of years old, nothing is. They're, they lived alongside people. And there's another way you could have recognized that dinosaur fossils are not from hundreds of millions of years ago, and that's because a fossil's a dead thing. And you've got death, uh, if you got death 100 million years ago, you got death before Adam sinned, but doesn't the Bible say that death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin? Is not indeed death the penalty for sin, the wages of sin? So yes, those are not millions of years old. They would have been uh, created at the same time as human beings, 
they would have been peaceful creatures originally. And again, that upsets people because they think, well, I've seen Jurassic Park and those things were not so nice. <laughs> but that's Hollywood fiction. Uh, the, the true history is that God, when God saw everything he had made, behold, it was very good. That would include all the animals originally. They would have been peaceful uh, creatures. Uh, death only came into the world after Adam's sin. So when you, when you see a dinosaur fossil in the museum and it's got a label attached to it, you know, millions of years old, you can say, that's not right. Because this had to happen sometime after Adam's sin, probably during the flood year. We think most of the fossils were produced during that, during that flood year. People think that scientists can, well, they can, they can date these fossils, right? They can scan them with their tricorder and it just tells them the age, you know. Well, fossils don't come with labels telling how old they are. It'd be nice if they did, but they don't. Those, those labels are attached later by people who were not around when the fossil formed. And I'm happy to talk about radiometric dating and stuff like that, but that doesn't really give you the true age of something. And the fact is, there is evidence that dinosaurs lived recently and not millions of years ago. For example, what, what, would, what would you think if I found uh, uh, remains of, for example, blood? You think blood would last millions of years? Because we found stuff like that in dinosaur remains. See, a fossil is where it, you know, the, the part of an organism, a bone perhaps, has been mineralized. The minerals have moved in and filled in all the little holes, and bone, bones are porous, which makes them light and very, very uh, strong. But uh, a fossil is heavy because the minerals have filled in all the holes. But we've found that with many dinosaur fossils, if you dissolve away the outer fossilized portion, the inside is still fresh. And those are actual images of soft tissue, things like skin and muscle from a T-Rex uh, femur, one of the leg bones. And they even found blood vessels in there, and, with, with, and some of them with blood cells still in them. So that's not gonna last millions of years. And in fact, it's still, those blood vessels are still soft and, and squishy. I've seen people pull on them and they're still elastic. That, that's not gonna last millions of years. A rock might, but that's not, that doesn't make sense. That shows us that dinosaurs lived recently and not millions of years ago. Uh, did they evolve? Well, no, not according to scripture. God made organisms according to their kinds. A kind is kind of a broad category, perhaps lining up in many cases with the family level in our modern taxonomic system, though not in all cases. But um, di dinosaurs can diversify, just like you can get different breeds of dog from two, that's fine. Uh, likewise, dinosaurs, you can get different breeds. We might classify them as different species but they're still the same kind. And the fossil evidence bears that out. This is from an evolutionist textbook. It's showing the dinosaur family tree. All dinosaurs are supposed to have evolved from that thecodont ancestor down there at the bottom. As it reproduced and, and slight changes occurred, you get all these different varieties. So all the splitting, that's where the evolution is happening. That's one kind changing into another. And, and the depth represents how far down into the geologic column, we find these fossils, which evolutionists believe represents millions of years. I would reject that, but in any case, um, my point is the, uh, the footnote there says highlighted areas indicate solid fossil evidence. So all the places that you see that are that light blue, that's where they actually find fossils. Where's all the evolution, the branching happening? All the places you don't find fossils. Isn't that interesting? The dinosaurs went to great lengths to cover up any evidence of their own evolution. <laughs> they hid all those transitional forms. But no, you can see there, there's just no evidence of one kind changing another. Variation within a kind, yes. One kind changing in another, no. What do dinosaurs eat? What's he thinking about eating? I mean, we've seen the movies, right? Is he eating those guys? Of course, we now know that humans lived at the same time as dinosaurs, so maybe Adam's in trouble, right? Because we've all, I mean, we've seen Jurassic Park. We know what dinosaurs eat. They ate lawyers, right? <laughs> so, well, what did they really eat? Well, Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, had teeth up to six inches long. That's a pretty good tooth with a serrated edge. How would the first T-Rex have been described? The first ones that God created, would they have been a plant eater, a meat eater, a scavenger, or a plant and meat eater? How many say plant eater? Okay, how many say meat eater? How many say scavenger? How many say plant and meat eater? Okay, well you did, you did pretty well because the, the answer is plant eater. So most of you got it, that's great. And uh, that surprises people because again, we've seen the movies, right? But uh, we know this from scripture that all animals were originally vegetarian. 
And since dinosaurs are animals, they would have been vegetarian too. Human beings are originally vegetarian. Genesis 1, 29 and 30, God speaks to Adam and Eve, and God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Verse 30, and also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. Would that include dinosaurs? Are they part of everything? Yes, everything's part of everything. I've given every green herb for food, and it was so. And so those first dinosaurs would have eaten plants. And that includes T-Rex. Human beings, originally vegetarian. Now, if you're going to have a hot dog for lunch, that's okay, because uh, in Genesis 9, after the flood, God gave humans permission to eat meat, right? Genesis 9, 3, where God says, everything that moves upon the earth, it shall, you know, it can be, it'll be food for you now. That's kind of what a hot dog is. So there you go. <laughs> so those first T-Rex would have been eating plants. They were vegetarian. We know that according to Scripture. And again, that bugs folks because of those sharp teeth, but the original dinosaurs would have been eating plants. But what about those sharp teeth? And indeed, T-Rex had six-inch serrated fangs, perfectly designed for ripping and tearing into watermelons and cantaloupes and all sorts of <laughs> fruits. Because if you think about it, there are some fruits that require something like a sharp tooth to get into them. I mean, we think of a watermelon, nothing could be softer than that, but it's, on, it's only soft on the inside. You have to get through that hard exterior. We use something like a knife, kind of like a sharp tooth, to get into it, right? Uh, T-Rex could just bite right into a watermelon. It wouldn't be a problem. So uh, we, can, we can understand that. And by the way, there are organisms today, there are animals that have very sharp teeth that are either entirely or primarily vegetarian. Uh, this particular primate, you look at the sharp teeth on that guy, and yet he eats primarily plants, only occasionally supplementing his diet with meat. Uh, this particular uh, monkey right here. He's got these incredibly sharp fangs, at least the males do. And you might think, well, that's got to be a meat eater, but he's not. It's a, it's a grass eater. Those things eat grass. The closest they'd come to eating meat would be eating an insect every now and then. But uh, yeah, they do not eat uh, meat in general. This particular skull, you might look at the sharp teeth on that and say, well, that's got to be a meat eater because of those sharp teeth, but it's not. This is the skull of a fruit bat, and we know what fruit bats eat. They eat fruit, amazingly. And so now, now at some point after Adam sinned, after because the world was very good when it was originally created, but after Adam sinned, some of the animals started eating meat. And by the way, there would have been no meat available before Adam sinned, because meat is a dead thing. Yeah, dead animal. And there would have been no death before Adam sinned. So of course they would have eaten plants. But some at some point after Adam sinned, some of the animals started eating meat. We know that because some of them eat meat today. But it's interesting that even today, animals that we think of as meat eaters will sometimes go back to their pre-fall vegetarian diet. Like lions, we think of lions as meat eaters, right? Well, there was a 350 pound female lion named Little Tyke, and she went her whole life without ever eating meat. She was raised in captivity. There she is with one of her uh, owners. Gentle creature. Reminds us the way all animals would have been before sin entered the world. Now they try to give her meat because we all know that lions need meat to live, but she didn't know that. She didn't even like the smell of it. You can see her turning away from it there. She didn't like that. She does like milk, however. So she's not vegan. She will eat, she'll, she'll take milk. She would eat eggs too, but that was about it. She would not eat meat. And you know, the Bible actually prophesied of a time in, uh, in Isaiah uh, Isaiah prophesied of a time in his future when uh, animals, some animals that we think of as carnivores, would go back to their vegetarian diet. Uh, Isaiah 11:7 and 65:25: The lion shall eat straw like the ox; the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Isn't that interesting? The Bible prophesied that that would happen, and we're apparently seeing the beginnings of that. So why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? That's a question that people sometimes ask. Yeah, because we've, we've learned some things implicitly about dinosaurs. They would have been vegetarian because all animals were. Uh, they would have been made on day six because all land animals were. But why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And there's a simple explanation for that. The word dinosaur is a modern word. It was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen, whereas the Bible was translated into English much earlier. Uh, there's the King James. There were, there were earlier English translations, but the King James was 1611. So the word dinosaur did not exist when the Bible was translated into English. Of course you're not going to find it. You won't find the word email in the Bible either. It didn't exist at the time, okay? But you will find the word dragon in the King James Bible and in other translations. And the Hebrew word that is translated dragon is tanin. 
And Tanin seems to refer to any kind of monstrous creature. It wouldn't be limited to dinosaurs, but it would certainly include them. And it would include aquatic creatures like plesiosaurs and things like that. So here are some instances in the Bible where that word is found. So yes, God did know about these incredible creatures. It's just not, he's not gonna use modern terminology. But what about specific varieties of dinosaurs? Are those mentioned in scripture? I believe at least one is. Now it's not gonna have a modern name, right? Because that would be modern, right? It's gonna have a, a Hebrew name, whatever the name was when the people originally saw these creatures. But if you read in Job chapter 40, beginning in verse 15, we read, we read about a creature called behemoth. Behemoth is the Hebrew word, kind of means beast of beasts. And it describes a creature that is, is just monstrous. And just to give a little bit of context, uh, and it, you know, you, you, we understand Job. Hopefully you've read that book and it's a, it's a wonderful account of history. Uh, it's classified as wisdom literature or poetic because the speeches of Job and his friends are poetic, but it's really just recording what happened. It's a history book really. And so um, you remember, we talk about the patience of Job and, and he, was, he was very patient. He never cursed God or anything like that, but he, he was getting a little impatient toward the end and we can hardly blame him. He wanted to have a conversation with God. He wanted to plead his case with his creator. And God graciously answered him, beginning in chapter 38. And God said, okay, but before we can have a conversation, let's see if you're qualified. And God began, began asking some questions of Job that Job could not answer. And Job got the point. He said, I can't, you know, I can't contend with the Almighty. He got the point. But uh, th so this is that section where God is speaking and he is asking Job questions and he begins talking about some of the animals that he created. And these are animals that we would have been very familiar with, but they get more and more impressive until we get to Job 40, 15, where we read about this, this beast of beasts. Now, my point is, this would have been a real creature that Job was familiar with, otherwise God's argument wouldn't make any sense, right? God's saying, you know, take a look at this thing that I made, and Job's like, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. That wouldn't make any sense. This is obviously a creature that he had seen in order for God to compare his power to this creature and point out, he's basically pointing out to Job, you can't even deal with one of my creatures. What makes you think you can argue with me? So let's take a look at the description of Bohemoth. Uh, behemoth, and uh, beginning in verse 15, look now at behemoth, which I made along with you. They're both made on day six of the creation week. He eats grass like an ox. So he's an herbivore, even at this point in history. We think Job was written around 2000 BC. So apparently these things were still alive at that time. Verse 16, see now his strength is in his hips and his powers in his stomach muscles. And that would be a good description of a, like a diplodocus that had the very long neck and the long tail, the long muscles along their body that they needed to support that long neck and long tail. Verse 17 says he moves his tail like a cedar. That's a tree. So when he moves his tail, it's like moving a cedar tree. And you can imagine that, yeah, that's probably what that would have looked like. Uh, his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He's the first of the ways of God indicating he's the most sort of impressive thing that God made. And we think that the sauropod type dinosaurs were the largest uh, land animals that have ever lived. It, it continues to say, only he who made him can bring near his sword, which sounds a little awkward in English, but it's, um, it's basically saying only God could attack this creature. If you come at it with a sword, it's just gonna bat you away with its tail and that's the end of you. Now, some Bibles in the footnotes will say behemoth, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. Now, the thing you need to remember about your footnotes is they're not inspired. It's the text that's inspired and infallible. Footnotes are not. They can be helpful, but they're not always right. Could behemoth be an elephant or hippopotamus? Well, do they have a tail like a cedar tree? No, an elephant has a tail like a little rope. Hippo has a tail like a little flap. They do not have a tail like a cedar tree. That would not make sense. <laughs> so I can't, I can't, be absolutely sure that behemoth's a dinosaur, but I can tell you it's not a modern animal. It's not an elephant or hippo because the description does not fit. In the next chapter in uh, Job, we read about an aquatic creature called Leviathan. Again, that's the original Hebrew name for it. And when we read the description, it sounds like it could be a, a plesiosaur or some similar animal that lived in Earth's oceans. Plesiosaurs had the flippers and the, and the long neck. Some of them had a long neck. Uh, verse one, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? That's a rhetorical question. Can you fish this thing out like you would catfish? No, 
course not. Verse 9, indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? Verse 10, no one is so fierce that would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? See the argument that God's making there? Job, you can't even deal with one of my creatures. What makes you think you can deal with me? Verse 15, his rows of scales are his pride. Verse 16, one is so near another that no air can come between them. So it's a scaly creature. Verse 22, strength dwells in his neck and sorrow dances before him. So that made me think of one of these long-necked plesiosaurs like an elasmosaur. Uh, verse 25, when he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Because of his crashings, they're beside themselves. On earth, there is nothing like him which is made without fear. Now again, some of the Bibles in the footnotes would say, you know, Leviathan, possibly a crocodile. But the description just doesn't fit. The, when he raises himself up, a crocodile can't do that. They can't get more than a foot off the ground because of that sprawling gait that they have. But an elasmosaur, they could raise their neck up out of the water. That would be very, very intimidating. So I think it's, it's, not a, it's not a modern creature. It's not a crocodile or something like that. What about flying reptiles? The Bible mentions those too. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 29, and again, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 6, speak of a fiery flying serpent. Serpent would be the ancient word for reptile. And they're mentioned twice there in Scripture that they're, that they're flying reptiles. Isn't that fascinating? And I went back and did a little research on the, the Hebrew word there, seraph, which is related to seraphim. Seraphim is the plural. That's a class of angels, but it's also referring to a physical creature that, that God made. So I think that's really fascinating. And there are a few other places where that seraph is found in Scripture as well. So yes, the Bible does refer to flying reptiles. There's no doubt about that. And so if these creatures lived and people saw them, and apparently they did, then people have the question, were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? And would they fit? That's kind of the next logical question, right? Well, would they have been on Noah's Ark? Genesis 7, 8 through 9, of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground... There went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female. So are dinosaurs part of everything that creeps on the ground? Of course. So yes, they would have been on Noah's ark. And this is where the critics say, oh, we got you here. There's no way you could possibly get all those dinosaurs on Noah's ark because dinosaurs were huge and so on. Now, it seems to me if you're going you're gonna to make an argument that you can't possibly get all those dinosaurs on Noah's ark, you need, to, you need to know two things. First of all, how big was Noah's ark? And secondly, how many animals would have to go on board and how much space would they take up? And the funny thing is, most critics don't know the answer to either of those. I'll say, do you know how big Noah's Ark was? They don't know. Do you know how many animals would have to go on board? I mean, two of each kind, but how many is that? Thousands? Millions? We don't know. That's what they say. Well, it seems to me that that is not a logical argument, that you can't possibly fit an unknown number of animals on a boat of unknown size, right? That's not a logical argument. That's, that's emotional. Well, we don't have to guess about the size of Noah's Ark. The Bible gives us the dimensions in cubits. The cubits, the distance from your elbow to the end of your hand. That's a little different for different people. So there's some leeway, but it's about 18 inches. The minimum would be 17 and a half inches. And so this would be the minimum uh, po possible size of Noah's Ark. More likely, it was 450 feet by 75 by 45. It was huge. See, people have these misconceptions of Noah's Ark and I'm sorry to say, we sometimes promote these in children's literature where you'll see the ark depicted like that. That's not the real ark, folks. The real ark had the same capacity as 522 railroad stock cars. It was huge. You can imagine Noah's shock if God told him to build a little bathtub ark. But no, God told him how to build a proper ark. And God knows how to design a boat. He designed the universe, and it works pretty well. I think he could design a boat. <laughs> So bathtub arcs would not weather a worldwide flood. The ark that God designed, optimally des designed to weather a worldwide flood. We've had engineers come in and study uh, the ark, like Tim Lovett he went in and did these amazing studies showing that if you change any of the dimensions of the ark, it's less seaworthy or less comfortable or, or what have you. No, the Noah's ark is designed to weather a worldwide flood. It was big, but was it big enough? How many animals would have to go on board? Now, two of each kind, but people have a, a, a mis- misperception there, because a lot of people think, well, that means you need two Dalmatians and two beagles and two border collies and two golden retrievers. And no, you just need two dogs. You can get all those breeds later. They're still, you know, God has built into animals the ability to produce offspring that are slightly different from themselves. That will never change one kind to another, never happen. But it does allow for diversification. It allows you to get different breeds. They're still dogs, and they always will be. But these breeds are recent. Golden retrievers didn't exist 200 years ago. It's a modern breed. It's the same way with the dinosaurs. 
You don't need two Triceratops, two Eoceratops, two Pachy rhinoceros, two Taurus. Those are all the same kind. You just need two of the Ceratopsian kind, and you can get all those different breeds later. They're classified as different species. That's okay. But we think there's, um, e even though there's over 600 dinosaur names, we think there's only about 60 dinosaur kinds. Okay, so if there's 60 kinds, two of each kind, there'd be 120 dinosaurs on board Noah's Ark. 120, that's not so bad. Uh, folks like John Woodmerappy have done studies estimating the number of animals that would go on Noah's Ark. These are his numbers. So less than 16,000 animals. And some people say, yes, but the dinosaurs are really big. So even though there's only 120 of them, they're huge, right? Some dinosaurs were huge. Some dinosaurs never got bigger than a dog. Some never got bigger than a chicken, like little Compsognathus there. That's all the bigger they got. We tend to remember the more impressive ones that we see in the movies, but some of them are very small. So there's the skull of a particular a dinosaur. And by the way, even those really, di really big dinosaurs, like you see in the museums that fill up the entire room, you know, from head to tail, they hatched out of eggs that are not much bigger than a football. The biggest dinosaur egg we found is something like that size. And so that means they, were, they didn't start out big. They started out pretty small, and they grew to those larger sizes. Uh, many reptiles today will grow rapidly to a, an adult stage where they can reproduce, and then they'll continue to grow at a slower rate as long as they live. Not all reptiles do that. We don't know if dinosaurs did that. But uh, wouldn't it make sense for God to select maybe some of the younger dinosaurs that had not reached their full size? Maybe not babies, but young adults, so they could go and multiply. That was the point of having um, animals on, on the ark, was so that they could go and reproduce afterwards. So wouldn't it make sense for God to take some younger dinosaurs rather than senior citizens? That would make sense, right? So we know the space available, 450 feet by 75 by three decks, a lot of space. There might have even been mezzanine levels, um, which would increase that. We know the space, we can estimate the space required. Birds take up very little space because they're small, most of them. Mammals take up the most space because there's the most of them. And reptiles, including the dinosaurs, take up less than 16% of the space on the ark for a grand total of 46.8%. So the animals would have taken up less than half the space on the ark. Some estimates are even less, but this gives you a feel for it. And by the way, sometimes youngsters, when they're in their math class, you know, when am I ever going to use this stuff? Well, there you go, right? <laughs> See, the critics don't bother to go through the math, and so they make these statements in ignorance. But as a Christian, I can say, I've, I've done the calculation, and if you think you can't fit all those animals, you don't know what you're talking about. So the, the dinosaurs would have been on Noah's ark. They would have come off Noah's ark. Don't you think that people would have encountered some of them sometimes and maybe written down the accounts? Wouldn't we find legends of dragons in history? They're not going to be called dinosaurs. That's a modern word. But they will be called dragons. That's the ancient word. And if you think about what a dragon is, it's, a lot of times our, our conception of a dragon is just combining the different types of dinosaurs. All kinds of legends. Legend of St. George and the dragon. Um, and we have found fossils of baryonics in that region. The, the, Marco Polo in AD 1271 reported that the Chinese royal chariots were occasionally pulled by dragons. Isn't that interesting? So they actually were able to make use of them. Lots of legends of dragons in China. Oh, they're all over the place. And apparently, it was, if, if you were wealthy in China, the thing to do was to have your own uh, dragons. In the year 1611, we, we know from records that the Chinese emperor appointed the position of royal dragon feeder, which makes me think they probably had some. There was a city in France that was renamed in the honor of the killing of a dragon there. The, the animal is described as being larger than an ox and had, uh, was armored and had horns on its head. And so isn't that fascinating? We, what about flying reptiles? You know, we, we, we have examples of those too. Uh, Herodotus, the Greek historian who confirmed some of the events of the Bible, uh, he, he heard about these winged serpents, flying reptiles, and he wrote about them. He, he encountered a valley full of dead, what we think are Ramphorhynchus. He described them accurately enough. We think that they were, Ramphorhynchus were small flying reptiles. They weren't that big, but they had a long tail. And then there were the big flying reptiles like pterodactyloids that had the wide wingspan, but they had a short tail. We think these are probably the Ramphorhynchus, the smaller ones. Uh, he says, winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and kill them. It's really interesting. He says, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feathered, but very like the wings of a bat. So he's pointing out, these are not feathers. They're not birds. They're serpents, reptiles, but they have a membrane-type wing like a bat. So, and, the, and the eyewitness reports of these go from 400 B.C. up to 1600 A.D., and then they stop. 
So we think we know when this went extinct, and it wasn't millions of years ago, it was about 400 years ago. You see, uh, occasionally you'll see winged serpents on ancient coins, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you might know that people sometimes in the past lived in caves. People sometimes ask me, do you believe in cavemen? Men that lived in caves? Yes. Lot lived in a cave for a while, if you read the scriptures. And people would occasionally draw on the cave wall, buffalo and humans, and occasionally things that look an awful lot like dinosaurs. Now, this is before dinosaur fossils were ever found. Dinosaur fossils were found in the 1800s. Okay, so before that, uh, people that are drawing these things must have seen the actual creatures. And we have a number of examples of what appear to be, for example, sauropod dinosaurs. There's a petroglyph in Natu uh, Natural Bridges National Monument, Utah. We've enhanced it for you on the PowerPoint, otherwise it doesn't look very good. It's hard to see, but it looks like a sauropod dinosaur with a long neck and a long tail. There are sculptures in France. They, they call these salamanders, but you can see they're reptiles. They're scaly uh, creatures there. And they, they do match uh, descriptions of certain kinds of known dinosaurs. There are ancient tapestries where you zoom in on them and you say, that looks an awful lot like you know, a, a dinosaur, maybe a myosaurus. There are sculptures from China. This is thought to be about 4,000 years old. And it looks for all the world like a ceratopsian type dinosaur, like a centrosaurus or a monoclonius. Here's another one that looks an awful lot like a protoceratops, also thought to be about 4,000 years old. Bishop Bell's tomb in Carlisle Cathedral has these brass strips along the side. The, the bottom one's been worn off. You see those brass strips? The bottom one's been worn off because there's normally a carpet that goes over this and people walk on it. And so over time, the bottom one is, is, is gone. Now we know when this guy died and was buried and his tomb dates back to 1496, 1496. And all, on these brass strips are depictions of various creatures, bats, dogs, fish, birds, and these guys. Isn't that interesting? Long before dinosaur fossils were found, people were drawing what appeared to be sauropod-type dinosaurs. A temple in Cambodia that has carvings of people and animals in it, and one of the animals there in the middle, isn't that interesting? It looks maybe like a stegosaurus, one of those kinds. The Australian Aborigines have a legend of a creature they believe lives in Lake Galilee, and apparently one of them washed up and was you know, dead. They call it Yaru, that's their name for it. That's their, that's their painting of it. And it looks like a, like a plesiosaur type uh, creature. Very interesting. Uh, Mokalium bembi, if you go to the African Congo, the natives there have a creature that they are afraid of. They call it Mokalium bembi, that's their name for it. And eyewitness reports are as recent as 1990. And they stop after that, so maybe it's extinct now, but perhaps it wasn't extinct just three decades ago. It's kind of interesting. Uh, they said the creature kills elephants. And by the way, if you show them a picture of a sauropod dinosaur, they'll say Mokalium bembi. If you show them a picture of a bear, they'll say, we don't, you know, we don't know what that is. So they're not making it up. In any case, most of the dinosaurs have died at this point, and the question is, why? Why did the dinosaurs die out? And of course, there's lots of things that have died out since creation. There were trilobites that used to fill Earth's oceans, and they're gone now, and there's woolly mammoths and things like that. There's lots of things that have gone extinct uh, since um, creation. Today, we have endangered species programs to protect those that are on the verge of extinction. Maybe we should have started those a little sooner. Maybe we still have some dinosaurs around. Uh, but in any case, there's lots of specific reasons, disease or famine, or they're hunted to extinction. Uh, and, and all of those w would apply to dinosaurs potentially. Uh, we don't know the exact mechanism, but we do know the ultimate mechanism. It's because sin entered the world. When Adam sinned, the world was no longer very good. God cursed it, and death and disease entered the world at that point. And so ultimately, the reason we have dinosaur fossils today and not living dinosaurs is because of sin. And we think most of these dinosaur fossils were produced in that worldwide flood. And so when you see a dinosaur fossil, you shouldn't be thinking millions of years of evolution. You should be thinking, oh, God judges sin because he's a righteous God. Of course he's going to judge sin. That makes sense. And so the secular world loves to use dinosaurs, especially with kids, to indoctrinate them into believing in evolution by telling them stories that are fiction but that sound believable about dinosaurs and that gets kids excited about it. We need to remember that Christians are not the only fishers of men. We can use the truth about dinosaurs to show kids and everyone else that the Bible really is true. It's the true history of the universe. That's what we wanna do at the Biblical Science Institute is reconnect the Bible to the real world. The Bible's not just a collection of interesting stories. It really happened. 
And it makes sense of the world that we have today. It explains why we have dinosaur fossils. The flood would account for that. It explains why we don't find transitions from one kind to another and so on. Uh, creation accounts for that. So uh, you, this presentation is available on DVD if you have a friend that you might want to give that to, Dinosaurs in the Bible. It's a great uh, uh, resource I'd encourage you to get. Uh, other, a few, let me just mention a few of the other resources we have out front there. We have Astronomy Reveals Creation, showing you how the universe declares God's glory, not a big bang or billions of years. Worlds of Creation takes you on a tour of the solar system, looking at all the planets and their moons, and showing how each one declares God's glory and refutes the uh, secular uh, ideas. Secret code of creation, this one's unique. It, sh it shows you that God has built an aspect of, of beauty into an area of creation that most people haven't even thought about, and there's no secular explanation for it, and it is remarkably beautiful. God has a wonderful sense of beauty. We have that on Blu-ray as well, because it is very pretty. And we have a book that goes along with that called Fractals, The Secret Code of Creation. And so that's a, um, and you can, look, you can leaf through that book and look at the pictures. No human being drew those. That's artwork of God. There's no secular explanation. We brought some children's resources. I didn't write these, but I highly endorse them. They're wonderfully written. Uh, answers books for kids, for example, gives you nice, concise, theologically and scientifically correct answers to the questions that kids have about the Bible. And a lot of the children's resources we have are on dinosaurs, because that's a great way. I mean, that would make a great Christmas present right there, because kids like dinosaurs. And why not use that natural interest to uh, get them interested in Scripture as well? Because Scripture does have something to say about this topic. And, uh, and check us out on the web as well, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. Uh, and thank you very much for having me out to speak. I really appreciate it. God bless. Thank you so much. I, the round of applause is the endorsement that all of us are feeling within. It's so great to have somebody come and speak truth in love with joy and the heavens declare the glory of God. I'll just add my endorsement to say at our particular moment, you hear me say it all the time, but the, the secular age that has kind of cemented and, and buffered us against any idea that God would be a part of any of this is crumbling. And that's the moment that we're in. Those, there is a tremendous shift, especially in the West, where people are the, the materialist, the exclusively humanist worldview is not sufficient. And young people today are fine. They are convinced now that it is not sufficient. And that shift is dramatic from where we have been. So work like Dr. Lyle's work is going to actually become increasingly important in the next three and five and 10 years as that shift takes place. And people now flood back saying that was not sufficient. And they look for answers.